Kuta. And uh, as a musician, he played piano and uh, he conducted ensembles. He teaches music theory and then moving to Cologne, he studied composition and electronic music. His work was done as teacher, for example, at the biannual Bi Bi Darmstadt New Music Summer Courses, um, at the Cologne and Folkwang Universities, the Royal Conservatory The Hague, and uh, lastly uh, at the Santa Barbara uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, where he was the Corwin Share uh, of Music. One of the greatest powers of sound as a musical expression lies in the creation of imaginary worlds emerging from the emotional repository of individual agents. The subversion of this proposition is also true insofar as the need for artistic expression through sound can come from occurrences and extra musical elements such as images, words, mathematical equations or biological data. The composition processes in the erudite contemporary music, whether of note-based or sound-based aesthetics, have accompanied the digital technology development empowering the impulse of creation through algorithmic and generative processes mediated by computer systems. On the last few decades, there was an outbreak of musical genres and musical expressions according to two principles, the integration of tradition and technolo technological means, and the rupture of all the contexts that cannot be seen as directly deriving from the computer and digital technology. This means that the creation process's trajectory goes from the concrete realities toward an external space based upon an understanding of the adaptation of the technical and technological realities to the needs of creation. While the, while the creation process relies on, a on an awareness of the technological potentialities as a means to attain an artistic result. The intersection between the acoustic and the digital as open ways of communication in permanent, permanent and mutual capacity being possible to be analyzed through computational humanized processes at the same time as creative augmented processes. In this equation, the resultant materials are not necessarily of an electronic character, but mainly enabling the extension or augmentation of acoustic compositional processes. This talk will step inside the processes of generating musical material from the author's mind as they are imagined and as they derive from visual stimuli. Due to last minute issues with flights, uh, Clarence is not in Oporto, but we are making this session partially remote and partially uh, presential. And uh, we will continue from Barcelona with the great Clarence Barlow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique, for a very enlightened introduction. I'm very sorry not to be with you there today. I was so much looking forward to that, but it'll have to be another time. The topic of the lecture today, which you can probably see about Enrique, is music derived from the visual and the visual derived from music. So I will look at my other screen to see what you are looking at. For a long, long time now, about 50 years, I've been very, very interested in deriving music, not only from music itself and musical knowledge and musical history and all of that, but also from extra musical sources, also from mathematics and from language. And the visual was something that has been very, very dear to me, even though I'm not a visual artist. And I have collected a number of things to show you within the next hour or so. So let's move without delay to the next image. This piece, 1972, Sinophony II, was a piece based entirely on sign tones. There are eight channels or eight tracks, but I'm showing you two tracks. And even then, after I composed the piece, which I did in the studios of EMS in Stockholm, I wanted to see the piece as well. So I worked out a computer program to take my data and convert it into visual images. So if you see where the mouse is now, I'm not sure whether you can see that, can you? Can you see the mouse, Enrique? Yes, sure. Yeah, we are I'm seeing. I'm moving it. 
Yep. Okay. So you, you see a red stripe which gets narrower and narrower and then interrupts over here and blue stripes which are going here and here. Now these stripes are each a sine tone. This frequency is about 195 hertz. This interval from this frequency to this one is one perfect fifth. And so I wanted to hear this piece and I've made a rendition of the graphics of tracks five and six only. Otherwise it becomes very complicated. And I'm going to play you a short excerpt of this. So I take it you heard this interruption very briefly, and you could hear some of these very high sound tones causing interferences. A friend and colleague of mine likened this piece to a visual planetarium, an auditory planetarium actually, and this is the visual version of it. Moving on to the next, a piece called Relationships Number no. 4 of 1976. It's for two pianos. And even there, I wanted to make a visual rendition of it. You can see at the top left, we are now talking about sound visualization. So to visualize this piece, which you can see sketched at the bottom with simple crayons, the two pianos are shown. The larger square is piano number one, the smaller square is piano number two, and they have different colors. And these colors come from these three color circles. So you can see C, G, D, they are circles of fifths, and the G corresponds to green, the B corresponds to red, and the E flat corresponds to blue. And these are all interpolations between the three main complementary colors or the three primary colors. And you can see the outer ring is pale, because these represent softer sounds and the inner ring is darker because it represents louder sounds. So, so I wanted to color all these little stickers and put them together like the sketch here at the bottom. Unfortunately, I realized that there had to be 70,000 of these stickers and it would be very, very difficult to do them accurately. And in those days I had no access to color plotting. But many years later, I managed to make this. And this was in the year 2001. And I'm going to play you four very short excerpts of this particular piece. In this particular rectangle, you can see a multitude of colors corresponding to an atonical or atonal system. And ametrical, you can see the dark squares all over the place. So it's atomical and ametrical. I'll play you that first. So here are probabilities of the 12 notes of the cycle. And what you heard was one piano on the left and one piano on the right, of course, with MIDI in this case. Now, this drawing has very similar colors. That's because the music is tonical, but they're still spread all over the, the place, which is because it's still ametrical. So that's still ametrical, but it's much more tonical. You can hear a kind of harmony. If I now go down to this one, it's atonical again, like the top one, but it's metrical. You will hear a one, two, three, one, two, three rhythm. And then here, finally, 
You will hear tonical metrical. So I finally had the key to doing the graph that I wanted to do back in 1976. And it took me so long to do it. But once I had these four pictures, I stopped because what was I going to do? Was I going to put it on the internet? At that time, 2001, I didn't have such extensive ac uh, access to the internet. And now I do, but I seem to have lost interest in following this project. Next picture. In 1981, I composed a piano trio for violin, cello, and piano based on three piano trios of the literature, Clementi's La Chasse, Schumann's trio in F, and Ravel's trio in A minor. And you can see the years of the completion of these works. And this spiral is based on these formulae. So if you set one for the violin here at I and I, two for the cello and three for the piano, you will get, excuse me, I have to really stop the phone. Uh, I'm talking on, I'm giving my lecture, all right? So I'll just cut this out. So over here, you can see that at the middle of the triangle, I have music of Clementi, Schumann and Ravel, all mixed in proportions of equal amounts. That means 33% Clementi, 33% Schumann, and 33% Ravel. And you will hear that here. So while you were listening, the instruments were moving along these three spirals. You can see the piano at point number eight, point number nine, point number 10, and the cello moving as well, and the violin. And the dotted lines show you uh, simultaneity. So at this point here, the piano is at point number nine, the cello is at point number nine, and the violin is at point number nine. So while they are moving, the closer they get to the three apices of the triangles, the more you hear of that composer's music. So an extreme is at near the end of the piece where it's 100% Clementi because they're in the apex itself, but very small amounts of Ravel, very small amounts of Schumann. Clementi is now finished, and you hear only Ravel and Schumann. So you can hear different proportions of three composers' music in three instruments. It's a bit like if you had nine record players and you had each instrument on one of the three, or at least three of, of the nine, and each piece each composer, also the three of the nine, you would hear this combination of different pieces in different proportions, moving along these spirals all the way from the middle to the end where you just have Ravel left. Schumann finishes more or less here. And then there's just Ravel left at the end. A piece of mine called Imianua Amnil, which means in January at the Nile, of 1984 for chamber or ensemble. You can see, I haven't written the instrument names very clearly. Soprano saxophones, these are two. Here is a piano. And at the end of the piece, the right hand is playing Japanese temple bells. 
And these are seven strings, four violins, two celli, and the double bass. And near the end, there are lots of disturbances. The saxophones are playing loud interruptions all the time. The strings are also doing loud interruptions and making hissing noises. And the piano is getting more and more dense as time goes on. So this is the score of the piece, but this is a very short recording. I'll show you, uh, this is part of a video that I made in around 2000. And the video shows this little ball moving along the spiral. Again, we have a spiral and moving along the spiral in time. And every time the ball crosses a line, you hear a note. And the further out you go, the more and more dense it gets. So we are now in circle 10 out of a total of 24. So somewhere in the middle of the piece, actually here. And this sound was made, this is the actual ensemble. So you'll hear more of it later. Next image. This is a photograph of Amsterdam opposite the studio Stein. Stein is a studio for electro-instrumental music. And I worked there quite a bit during the year 1986 for most of the year. And I was requested some years later in 2000, this was 1986, but in 2000, I was requested to make the cover of a CD. So I used that photograph as an inspiration. And in this piece called Until, you hear four very short excerpts, the whole thing, the piece is four minutes long, but I'm playing you four excerpts of four seconds each. I'll play them first, then I'll explain. Second example. Third example. Fourth. So I'll play it again after I've spoken a little bit. What you can hear is a melody, 11 notes a second, circling around a drone, an ele electronic drone, which sounds right through the piece, through the four minutes. But very gradually, these notes regroup themselves, forming a different harmony, a different tonality. At the beginning, they're very clearly tonal related to the drone. But little by little, the tonality shifts and moves to a new drone, which is not heard until the very end. So I'll play it again, listen to very harmonic music around the drone, a little less harmonic around the same drone, even less harmonic around the same drone, and finally very harmonic around a new drone, which has been developing all the time through the four minutes of the piece. <laughs> this image was to separate all the pixels into red, green, and blue, which are then treated as monochromatic. And I faded in the one picture. So you can see these houses are actually very faint on the left. And these houses are very faint on the right. And I shifted just like I did with the pictures of the piece, with the notes of the piece. I move from the left picture to the right picture, but they're the same picture, only regrouped and shifted. So this rooftop was originally here, but then was shifted to here. So this picture is a kind of reconstruction and then the, the monochromatic images are re-merged in their original colors, the red, green, and blue. So it's a very um, impressionistic looking image of this particular CD cover. Now a piece, and I moved to a different topic, image sonification. This piece is based on a text written in Cologne dialect. I don't know if any of you can speak German, but Cologne dialect 
is something between Cologne, between German and Dutch. And that's the dialect of the city of Cologne. So for some reason, my sound is cutting out. Is it cutting out? No, we are, I hear my, it's, yeah, it's, go it's ahead. good, Clarence. We are hearing you perfectly. Okay, because sometimes I can hear my own voice coming back very suddenly at me. So these are five postcards. The Opera House, the West Gate of Cologne, the Hohenzollern Bridge, the Rhine Panorama, and you can see Cologne Cathedral in at least three pictures, and St. Gerion's Church. And I use these for this diagram of parameters. You can see the Opera House, you can see the Hohenzollern Bridge, the West Gate, the Panorama, and St. Gerion's Church. Here they are again at the top. And these are parameters which control the amount of pitch of letters of this text, which is written in this dialect of Cologne, you can see the probability. So I will give you a short example. If you look at the beginning of this box number one, you can see 40% of number one, which is 40% are letters. About 18% is phrases and about 42% is sentences. And a sentence is to be seen as chords. Single letters are single notes. And then you see things like black, white, and mixed. You can see quite a lot of mixtures here, very chromatic. And you can see here loud and soft. You can see that mixed as well. You can see the durations, long and short. And you can see the use of the pedal, either pedaled or not pedaled. And this is the beginning of the piece. And this is the end of the piece. Now, if you look at the end, you will see a lot of pentatonic. And I will explain that after I've played this example, which is the beginning. So these are each, each note is a letter. The beginning is in Cologne on Rhine. In German, you would say in Köln am Rhein. And in Cologne dialect, in Köln am Ring. So that's the dialect of Cologne. And N is E-N, Köln, K-O-L-N with an umlaut. Am Ring, the whole phrase, that's why you hear the same chord played twice, because it's two syllables, N, Köln, Am, Ring. And that's the way the whole piece goes. The, there are 15 versions of text music. This is number eight, and it takes about 10 minutes. The shortest version is two minutes long. And the longest version, number six, is nearly four hours long for solo piano. Now here is the end. Why is this pentatonic? Look at this box, three key colors, black, white, mixed. At the end, the bridge occupies the whole area, which means just black. So that's why the end is pentatonic because the bridge is there. So that's the end of text music number eight. And each text music piece of the 15 is based on a given text. The very long one, nearly four hours, is based on a text by Samuel Beckett. Now we come to a couple of videos. I hope you have heard of Oscar Fischinger. He was a well-known 
creative visual artist, a video maker who worked in the, seven, in, in the 20s and 30s. And then he went to Hollywood in the 40s and became a commercial video maker for Walt Disney. But his work is very creative before he went to Hollywood. The music he chose, I think it's very bad taste. It's by a composer called Jacinto Guerrero. And I'm first going to play you, it's a two minute film, the whole film of Oscar Fischinger. It's the next slide. So this film was made from 2,800 charcoal drawings. Each frame is a drawing in charcoal and Fischinger drew all of them synchronized to the music of Mr. Guerrero, which I like to describe as uh, circus music. In 1995, I was requested to make a new soundtrack for this film. What the people who commissioned me, it was the art, art hall of, of uh, city of Bonn in Germany. What they wanted to do was have contemporary composers a hundred years after the invention of film to make new soundtracks for Fischinger. So what I did was you can maybe recognize in these schematic images, the objects of Fischinger. And I decided to use a technique that I just developed at that time called spectastics, spectral stochastics. The idea is you have a very quick flurry of notes. They go 24 notes a second, actually, uh, 25. Uh, wait a minute, it's America maybe with 25, right? Or no, Europe. 25 frames a second, so 25 notes a second. But at the same time, music of Conlon Nancaro, I don't know if you've heard of him, a wonderful composer who left the US and went to Mexico. Uh, he was practically thrown out. And his music forms another track of the movie. But I'm just going to talk about the, of the soundtrack, I should say. I'm just going to talk about the flurry, the spectastics. Let's take this hypothetical example. Here you see a very broad object. This is not a real example. I've simply constructed this as a kind of example for this talk. So here you see a very broad one. Here, the flurry of notes, the 24 or second, or 25, will sound very bright, like the sound E, like the mouth, when the mouth is spread, you make, can make a sound E. But if you have this object, which is very round, then that tone cloud will sound like an O, because it's like a round mouth. 
And each of these objects create a set of formants, which you can see here from one to five. For instance, the E is number two, very distant separated formants, and number one, close formants. So those who know phonetics will know exactly what I mean when I talk about formants of vowels. And these are the positions of the objects, x, y, width and height. And this is the sum of these probabilities which generate the stochastics. So in other words, if you have a, a peak which corresponds to the amplitude of the formant, this will be the probability of that frequency appearing in the tone cloud. So this tone cloud you will hear when I play you the actual film. And otherwise you will hear a kind of tango resembling a Conlon Nankaro study number six, which is why I call the piece Estudio Siete, because it's based on Oscar Fischner's study number six and on Conlon Nankaro's study number six. And this was made in Cuenca in Spain, but then completed in my own studio in The Hague in the conservatory of The Hague, Laia, which is a studio theater. That was my studio, number seven. So here is my soundtrack to the film of Oscar Fischer. So you can see his film and my music. It's a metamorphosis of Oscar Fischer's film and a paraphrase of Conlon Nankaro's player piano piece number six, both study number six. Also two minutes long. Every time an object becomes broad, you hear E. I'd like to play you this film two more times because there were some changes. The Fishinger Foundation, which is centered in Los Angeles, caused a big problem with me because I made this film. Now I was commissioned by the Art Museum of Bonn, but they didn't like the idea. They said I should not have been using Fishinger's film for my film. And they threatened to take me to court so I made my own film later, and you can see it's no longer Fischinger, but you can see the link to Fischinger, and it's the same soundtrack.
So you can see it's no longer Fischinger, but definitely derived from Fischinger. One more use of that particular Fischinger idea, and back to the piece in Januar am Nil, in January at the Nile. In the middle of this piece, what you will see first is this ball moving, and then there is a small break of two minutes where you can see the Fischinger objects again, but this time different. So here is the film. This is what you will see. So you probably noticed that the sounds here are electronic, but in the previous recording, they were the real musical instruments. I decided to make this as a kind of synthetic film. And so the sounds are all sounds of the 1950s, electronic sounds of the 1950s in a film made in the year 2000. In 1998, I was invited to write a piano piece to celebrate the birthday of a pianist, Christy Becker. I will not say how old she got because she doesn't like me to say that. But I took her photograph and analyzed the pixels. Now, this is not the photograph. This is the overlaying of 10 pages of the score. So each page is notes. Left to right is time, bottom to top is pitch, and if you look at these two dots here, these are these two notes over here. And you can see it going up. So this first bar is already finished 
about here. And this first page enlarged is here. And this is the second page. But if you overlap all the pages, you will get this picture, which is very close to her face. As a prelude, I take her name written in katakana script, Japanese, Kurisuti Bekkaro. And I draw that as a pitch time diagram. So again, having done this, I was not just satisfied to hear the piece performed by her, I actually made a film. Now, how was the piece composed? I will go very quickly through this. Here is the actual pixelated photograph. It's quite different, you will notice to this, but very similar. And I put two dots on the picture and made radial lines come out and all the pixels that fall on the radial lines are chosen for one page of the piece. Then I shift the radial lines, I shift them, and you get a new set of pitches. And then, of course, the second point is I used the piece until which you saw the houses of Amsterdam based on the harmonies of that piece, because Christy Becker has performed that piece. That was the recording you heard. I choose the harmonies to further filter which notes I'm using. And then the keys should not fill more than two hands. And then I have a photo phonetic mask based on the Bengali words, Kuri Shuti Bekar, which means 20 threads of cotton, unemployed, that's Bengali. And you can see some of these lines are dotted. They are not used, they are unemployed. So the Bengali words Kuri Shuti Bekar form a further filter. And then by filtering everything through these various constraints, I get this. First the prelude, then the shakon. Page one.
So those are the 10 pages of the Shakon, and the prelude came first with the Japanese script, Kuri Suti Beka. Another birthday candidate. You may have heard of the composer or may know his music, Tom Johnson. I was requested to make a piece for his birthday. They're all round birthdays, multiples of 10. And in this case, I can say safely, it was his 60th. So sitting in a train one day on the way to Amsterdam, I did some sketches and I wrote his name on a piece of paper from left to right, Tom, John, and I, for some reason, chose the NH vertically, S-O-N. And then after lots of thinking about it, I decided to draw circles through Tom or J-O-S or M S O J, for instance. And then I decided, okay, to make, horiz make vertical lines go through this graph. And every time a letter would be touched, a sound would appear. So you can see here, T-O-M, that's T-O-M. And this is the full name. But then I allow the letters to move along the circles in an anti-clockwise manner. And I do this 91 times. And every time I do it, I scan from left to right the new graph and get a new score. And here is the next scan and the next scan. But they are also overlapped in such a way. Can you see O, O, O? This O, O, O is middle C, 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 C. And then you hear the same again here, C, C, C. And again, C, C, and the next one's off the screen. So the O, O, O goes right through the whole piece equidistant. Only here I have a fermata. Otherwise you can see C, 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 C. excuse me. <coughs> So this is an excerpt. I will not play the full piece, but I will play enough for you to see the music moving from here to here. Maybe another 10 seconds. So in this case, you're not hearing the recording of the flute, clarinet, trumpet, piano, vibraphone, viola, and cello, but a MIDI rendition. I originally wrote it for guitar, saxophone, and double bass, but the band broke up when I gave them the piece. I hope not because of it. So here you can see Tom Johnson at the very beginning, and here you can see the letters are moved, and I make them move in the alphabet as well, and if they move beyond the Latin alphabet, they become Greek and Cyrillic, but the O, O, O are still there. And here is a little very quick film showing the whole piece in a few seconds. So the piece is three minutes long. And every time, I'll do it one more time. And the vertical lines are the scanning lines which move from left to right. So another piece based on images. This is an image from the internet of the church of St. Peter in the town of Leiden in Holland. I was requested to make a piece for two organs based, well, they didn't tell me what to base it on. I decided to base it on the image of the church and the two organs were microtonally tuned. Here you can see, well, I'll, let's do this one first. You can see more or less equally spaced lines, but they broaden towards the top. But here they are kind of jerky. This is because this is the chromatic scale, but rescaled to a psychological scale called the Bach scale, B-A-R-K, the scale of psychological pitch, subjective pitch, and that shows the, at the upper range of our listening, we hear more clearly. At the bottom range of our listening, 
we hear very muddily, things are much jammed together. As, uh, the same interval sounds much smaller in the bass than in the treble. So I'm going to play you the beginning of this piece for the two organs. This is mean tone tuning, chromatic tuning. The organ is of the 15th century. This organ is of the, of the 19th century. And you will hear it going from here to about here. So you will hear big clusters when these Gothic windows appear. Watch the mouse. So this example was about two and a half minutes long, but the whole piece is about seven. And the rest of the piece is based on different techniques altogether. So we've come to the final piece in this talk, a piece called Ertur or Erta. And I will explain why later. I was requested by a friend of mine who has paintings by Alphonse Bucha as a collection. And they were going to make a big exhibition with 78 of his pictures of his collection. And he wanted me as a friend to write music for the opening of the exhibition. So I decided to base my piece on the actual paintings themselves. If you look carefully, you will see here a rectangle coming out of a gray mass. Here is just two colors. It's gray and the other color is the most common color in the picture with a small tolerance. So it's not exactly one color, but it's a small band of colors, but certainly you might say very pale beige and the rest is gray. But as the piece goes on, this is just one section section five of 37 sections. And so five of 37. And these are just four different frames of a video that I made to accompany the piece. So here you see the, the middle getting a little clearer. Here it's even much clearer. You can see the rectangle is much broader. And here the rectangle has now covered the entire picture. But what's also happening is the colors are getting more and more like the original. So I'm increasing the width 
the height of the rectangle, starting from a small hole in the middle, and increasing the bandwidth of the colors. The title comes from the word aperture. You might say, for instance, in Spanish and Portuguese, apertura. And this is part of the P, and this is part of the A, of the A. So that's why this very strange title, Ertur, is like a hole in the middle, and gradually, if it goes any wider, you will see the word aperture, because there is an aperture which is opening very, very slowly to encompass the entire picture. The music was based on Janacek. Now, Mucha and Janacek were friends, and they came from Moravia. They were born in the same place, and they were about 12 years different in age. Janacek was the older. And Janacek wrote this piece called The Barn Owl, which is part of a set of pieces. I chose one piece for each of the Mucha paintings. And just like the aperture, I filter out all the outer notes. So in the beginning of my piece, you will see a very small range of pitches. But as time goes on, the range increases and increases and increases. And this is somewhere in the middle. So you can see the original piano check. And so what I do with that filtered music is I orchestrate it for these five instruments. In Lisbon, you probably know the ensemble called uh, Miso, the Miso Ensemble. I wrote a piece for them back in, 19, in 2010 to celebrate their 25th anniversary. That piece was called Vinte Cinco Anes, 25 Rings in Portuguese. And this is meant to be a equal, so it's 16 minutes, the other piece was one minute, and I have sent Miguel Asguin the score, so I hope they will perform it sometime. These five instruments are also microtonally retuned. Now, if you look at, for instance, this E, 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 all the way through, that's over here. So you can see the black part of the score is orchestrated for the instruments. And here is a MIDI rendition as a film of section five. So since it's only about half a minute long, this section, I'll play it one more time, and then look carefully in the middle at the beginning and you will see the rectangle increasing in size and in color depth. One more thing, the size of the painting determines the length of the section. The area of the painting in square inches is equal to the duration of the section in seconds. So a much bigger painting will give you a longer section and a smaller one the opposite. So I've spoken for exactly one hour and this is the end of my talk. So I think we have come to the question and answer section. Thank you so much, Clarence. It's a pleasure to hear you. And for sure, we could hear you more two hours uh, because it's really a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for this. For sure, we, we will have uh, some questions. Uh, while people think in some questions, I just want to say that it's uh, we, we, with a great 
uh, emotional charge that I remember your lessons at the Santa Barbara universities for an auditorium full of people, some of them making your course as a minor, so not only musicians attending. So thank you so much for, for these memories as well. So I will pass Pleasure. now to the, to the public if they have some questions. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, so I was wondering, first of all, thank you for your talk. It was very wonderful to hear you. Uh, I was wondering, when you created your piece, Studio Siete, uh, you did the inverse that Finchinger did. Uh, and back then, it was common for other animators, such as McLaren or Lin Lai, to create uh, animations based on the sound. Uh, was your pro process of creating animation based on sound important when you did the opposite? It was. It was a, a very similar to the process of, that Fischinger himself used, because Fischinger based all his frames on the music of Guerrero. So in other words, he based his film on music, and I was requested to make music based on the film. My colleagues, who there were about six of us composers, they did their own music totally differently. But me being who I am, I used an algorithmic method to derive, to derive sounds from the images. So it was a similar reverse process, you're right. But I didn't try to follow Fischinger's own methods in the way he derived it from the sound. Thank you very much. Pleasure. If there's uh, more people. Hi, Clarence, how are you? Well, thank Hi. you. We just met. Uh, so thank you, Clarence, for your talk and your generosity. And Enrique, thank you for your moderation. Uh, so Clarence, I would like to ask you a favor, uh, which would be to expand on the notions of model, diagram, uh, and schema in your I would call them isomorphies, especially when you bring image as a picture back into the mix and how you go from what I, I think we, we, would, we would call from a dense syntax and semantics of the image, the representational, back into music, which is, has a differentiated syntax and semantics as the notational. Uh, I, I want to hear about you, uh, um, I want to hear you about um, what, what's your take on the, uses and misuses of models, diagrams, and geometry in making these isomorphies. Thank you. Well, let me uh, explain that I am not a visual artist. So if I make my music visual, it's just to see the score as an image. And that has no pretensions at all towards visual art. But on the reverse, if I take an image, and I've done it differently every time, as you can remember maybe from this talk, Every time I have an idea, I just realize it in order to make a piece of music that I will like. It is not just sonification in the sense of this is the piece. This is the, this is the picture. I want the result to be something that I would be happy with and be glad to listen to and be even humorously touched. So I don't follow it in a totally, my techniques are very algorithmic, are very scientific, but I don't do it just to demonstrate a point. I just want to make a nice piece of music. Sorry, so you would say that uh, a lot of people working with the same kind of methodology, mainly using algorithmia and computational models, sometimes they're much more focused on the protocols that they're creating, but even when you're creating the protocols, you're already trying to address or forecasting the type of statics that you may get uh, musically from those protocols, right? Yes, absolutely. I was the director, the music director of the 14th International Computer Music Conference, ICMC, in 1988 in Cologne. And about 240 pieces of computer music were entered. My jury and I thought that they were mostly horrible. And we picked only about 12 pieces, but you can't make a festival out of 12. So I suggested different venues, a cafe, 
a concert hall, a beer drinking hall, all kinds of places where some of these pieces might be more suitable. So many of them were not suitable in concert halls because they were horrible pieces of music, which you could not listen to in a hall. You don't want to listen to a CD of them. You want to drink beer and, while you're listening. Alcohol was into the mix to like to, as a filter for those kind of, for those compositions. Okay, thank you, Clarence, for your, for your answer, uh, answer yeah. Hi, Clarence. First of all, I would like to thank you. It's a pleasure to hear you, and it's a great honor to, to have the possibility to attend to, to a class of yours. Thank you. I'm not from the musician area, so th this was, in a sense, Chinese for me. Uh, it, it was a challenge to try to, to follow it, but an interesting challenge. And I just want to make a comment because while I was uh, watching and thinking about it and even following what I've read from you, <clears throat> I remember that some years ago my research focused on visual poetry starting in the Middle Ages um, and, and then in the 18th and 19th century, but mainly the one produced in the uh, nowadays Germany in Middle Ages. And it was very interesting to see how historiography dealt with that uh, uh, compositions in the late 19th and then 20th century. Um, because of the formal and mainly mathematician um, uh, uh, dispositions that ordered the creation of that visual poetry at the time, it was poorly recognized during a quite a significant decades. And only recently, in the last years, it has been recognized as a process and with a lot of interesting aspects. So just, just to say, and after Diogo's question, it's really, it's really a pleasure and a, an add-on uh, to hear an artist to, to share that this creative process, though it's, it's formal basis, mathematician, computer, and so on, and programmatic basis, and even though with that aesthetic uh, um, demand, I would say, more than your intention, it, it's a demand and it's absolutely recognizable. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you for, for making me think about that with a cross over time uh, relation. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Uh, Clarence, uh, I, I will ask something. Um, I'm remembering Joel Shadaby that passed away very recently. Yes. And somewhere he wrote that all the music after the 90s could be considered computer music once that uh, all the music is more or less computer-aided or computer-mediated in the process of making music. As a pioneer, maybe for the young, young generations, for our students, it's difficult to imagine the challenges in the beginning of your career when starting to develop this kind of algorithmic thinking. Um, what do you think, or can you explain us a, a little bit or give a, a little insight what was your main motivation to, to start doing music like this? Let's say that when I started to compose, and that was a long, long time ago, about uh, 60 years ago, I began to write music in classical styles. When I was 17, for instance, I was composing like Rachmaninoff. Not as good, but like Rachmaninoff. When I was 19, I moved on to Bartok. Then I began to write 12-tone music. And at some point in 1970, when I was 24, I had an idea for a piece which was entirely algorithmic. It just came to me. I had no understanding as to why I thought about it. And it based on algebra as well. This idea just came. The music was there in my head. And I realized that in order to write it down, I would have to use some mathematical techniques. Obviously, I didn't want to prove anything. I made the formulae so that the piece would come out the way I wanted and the way I heard it. So I moved on from there. And then since then, I've written very little spontaneous music. Most of it comes to me as an idea. And then I develop it using some tools. Sometimes I think maybe I will compose again spontaneously, but it doesn't seem to happen. I seem to have become tied to that. But technology is not a way of describing music. You cannot describe computer music as anything made or aided by a computer. 
in, the in 1988, when I was director of that conference, people were submitting pieces played on a MIDI keyboard and saying it was computer music. I said, well, this is just spontaneous music composed and played on a MIDI keyboard. So how could you call it computer music? So it's like saying all the music from, I don't know, maybe 1600 or so was ink music. So you can call it ink music because of the technology used at that time. That would be nonsensical. So just to say what, the, uh, what kind of machine I used, if I drive in a car to a certain place, am I an automobile uh, user in, in, in doing what I did? If I drive to the church to play the organ, am I an automobile organist because I used a car to get there? So I, I think the technology is not, uh, it's not to be linked with the artistic result. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I answered the question. One question more from Jose. Hello, Clarence. Um, Hi. Uh, nice to meet you, like, not, not in person, but now with seeing face to face with a mask between. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. It's, it's a pleasure. I, I know your music for, for a while. And I don't know exactly what, what my question is, so I'm going along the, the, the speech and let's see where it goes. But it's, I understand that you, um, that you want to, to, to write music, or you, you have an aesthetic um, um, a goal, a uh, music um, goal. But in a way, it's it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a, an amazing pleasure to 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 understand the process, to understand the concept, and to understand the, the motivation. So, I don't know if you feel like that because a, a creator's life it's 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 always a, a strange balance between our needs, our ego, and the way how, that we relate to 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 our to the audience. And in a way, we you, we want to please ourselves. Uh, our uh, purposes, but we we need to relate to everyone everyone else or or to a, a group of people that we really want to to connect. So my question is, do you think because it's very it's very hard to believe in you when you're saying your only goal it's the the, the musical goal because you have so much. Um, uh, effort and a very interesting and and, very, and lots of nuances and a lots of poetry in your process that it's very hard to to believe that uh, the piece it's not the process. Um, do, do, do you think that okay? I, I really want that the audience know here's my piece, but knows the process, or you don't think in that when you are creating or when you are start to create a, a piece. Well. As uh, you pointed out, I write pieces because uh, they come to me. It's not as if I sit and think, oh, what can I compose and, and think and think and think. If I'm requested to write a piece, my mind comes up with something at some point and I don't slave over it. So I want to make a piece that I like, but because my techniques are sometimes quite intriguing, I like to share them with people. So I don't write the pieces in order to share the techniques. But if I think the techniques are quite funny, or if they come up with something very interesting in them, I'd like to share that. And since I joined the teaching profession back in 1982, I uh, have something to I talk about something, and people said, Why don't you talk about your own music? At the beginning, I used to play other people's music, but then I found I knew my music much better than other people's because I don't study so much other people's music. I listen and enjoy, but I don't study. So I decided to use my own music. And since the technology that I use and the techniques more interesting than the technology are maybe interesting for other people to share with me, I then present them happily in a lecture or in an article. I hope that is a kind of answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, it, it, more or less. But I, I was a little bit more curious if you if if you don't feel that in a way the the, the technique it's it's not a, it's not the, a huge part of the piece. But but it, I think it's a conversation to have another you know, time with with some beers and and, and, right. and music. That I, I have. Could a say, I could say one thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, a very interesting article written by Tom Poller, who lives in Berlin, on my technique of making. Uh, instruments speak 
This piece, Imbianoa Amnil, I didn't mention this, but every sound there is derived from the sound of speech. For instance, Imbianoa Amnil Mumied An Malin. I could point out the, the part of the piece where it sounds like that. I wrote a big orchestral piece called Why Me, No Money, My Way in the middle of the piece, played by strings. You can actually hear the words. So did I do it because I like the technique? No, it's just that I had this idea. What if I made an orchestral score based on spectral synthesis and tried it out and it worked? But this article by Tom Poller, he says, Clarence Barlow has never used his techniques as a thing in themselves. They just come into the piece and they contrib contribute to the piece, something or the other, but he never makes it the main point of the piece. Okay, thank you. that now you you answered the, the really the, the question, but uh, okay. but I, I'm remembering. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not very sure about the process, but I remember a very funny and very curious piece that you wrote. I I, I think it was a, a, a piece for the uh, something uh, celebration with the um, the Dutch queen. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, and then I, I don't remember if you if you orchestrate a, a slow down process or a, a faster process. I remember, and and if you, I don't know if you want to describe the that piece uh, very faster than me because I don't really know exactly like like you. I can describe it, and that's one of the few pieces of mine where the result is not supposed to be nice. I had this idea of taking the Dutch national anthem the very beginning, the first lines, Wilhelmus van der Sauer, then ik van der Bloed. That's the first line of the Dutch national anthem. And it's so ironic because the Dutch claim not to like the Germans, but it says, I am of German blood. That's the end of the first line. So I decided to code that as a piece of music, which was sound actually quite boring. It's not long. It's only about uh, one and a half minutes, but after the piece was played and everybody, my friends wondered at why I wrote such a strange, boring piece. It was very short and it was one of five pieces of the same length. I then took the recording and sped it up 16 times. And in the sped up version, you can hear the Dutch national anthem, melody and text. Okay, but in, in that case, only you uh, take the, the the pleasure of the, that that process. You 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 didn't present the that result of the piece to the audience. So no, not to the audience. Uh, the queen was sitting in the front row, and she must have been quite puzzled by that, which amuses <laughs> me. But I gave a CD to all my colleagues who contributed to the concert, so they know. <laughs> okay, okay. So and in my lectures. Okay, that's that's quite fair. I think we have a question from the online audience. Uh, Diog, do you want to to share with us? Yeah. So hi again, Cla uh, Clarence. So before I read the question, I I think actually you have something there with the ink ink music idea, to be honest. But then going forward, so Clarice, one of our students that that wasn't able to attend today, uh, she posted on Facebook um, her question, which would be. Oscar, Oscar, oh, sorry, Oscar Fischinger, as an abstract animator, created animations with the union of abstract images and sound, like the example of the studies number six. I would like to know your point of view in relation of other experiments of image unification. They can be, can they be directly related to animation, or the connection of image and sound are the key to form an animation equivalent of image unification. Yes. Okay, my answer would be a very, very general one. I would say anything goes. If you have an idea and you like the idea, go ahead and do it. So I would not make a, a grand philosophy out of my approach. If I have an idea sitting in a cafe and I like the idea, then I will go ahead and do it. And one of the things that attracts me is converting image into music or even making the music visible by converting it into an image. But I also derive music from mathematics, from algebraic formulae, not because the formulae are beautiful. Uh, in one case, let me give you a very quick example. I took a sequence to generate the number pi, 3.14159 and so on. 
There was a sequence which was developed by an Indian mathematician in the 12th century, but then also developed by Leib Leibniz himself independently. And it gave me an idea for an electronic piece, which I generated because I knew I would like the sound. And one of my students said, I think this is my favorite piece of yours. It wasn't so interesting that it was the formula, but the formula inspired me to make an electronic piece, which I could understand in advance the sound of. So I hope that's a kind of answer to the question, but I don't have a philosophy or a principle. I just do what comes. <laughs> that piece is not approximating pi? It is. Thanks. <laughs> it was played in Porto. Exactly. Um, because probably there are some composition students here in the session, and I've read an interview by you uh, made uh, some time ago, and um, the interview was um, asking about the question of developing uh, personal voices or the students of composition or the composers that uh, uh, tend to, um, to pursue a personal voice. I, I think I know the, your answer. But uh, what do you, you, you think about this? I think it's important for the community to, to hear your words about the topic. I think there are uh, two sides to this, the answer I will give you. One is, I'm extremely happy that no composition student of mine tried to make his music sound like mine. Sometimes this happens, and I'm very un uh, unhappy when I see that as a clear result, people copying their own teachers. And the other thing is, I have never encouraged either in myself or in other people, my own person as being the uh, expressor. I never try to express myself. I have an idea to make a piece, like I might take some Lego bricks and make some sort of an object. I'm not expressing myself by using Lego bricks. I just want to make something. A composer is somebody, somebody who puts things together Componere. So you put things together. And the person has no place in this. I feel I'm not interested in developing a personal style. If I have to, if I happen to be recognizable, it's because I'm not really very free. And maybe I cannot jump over my own shadow, as one says in German. So personal style, if a student tells me, and they somehow have told me this, I want to develop my own personal style. I said, Write good music, that's enough. <laughs> that's fair enough. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if more questions, yes? Hello, Clarence. Thank you for the talk. Hi. Sure, my I'm pleasure. just wondering, in this process from converting uh, music to image or image to music or even with the algorithms, uh, what happens if the result is not the one that you expect, or if it doesn't turn out to be uh, good in your ears? Uh, do you change it? How, how do you do it? Definitely I change it. Or if it doesn't work, I give it up altogether. But uh, I don't want to produce a piece of music which I don't like, except for that boring Dutch national anthem piece, which I think is very funny. But I... Um, want to write music that I feel satisfying. For instance, just uh, last year, I made a piece based on the genome of the coronavirus. And it was liked by some people, put on a CD even, and played in festivals. Now I think because corona is making us all tired, it's not being played anymore. It was probably linked to last year. But I tried it first using a kind of frequency transformation, and it sounded horrible. So then I did it. No, I'm sorry, the other way around. I tried it first using amplitude transformation and it sounded horrible. Then I rethought the whole thing and used frequency as my tool. And then I liked it. And I thought, oh, this is turning out nicely. So maybe that's an answer to your question. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. Well, there was no big matter if the piece was sounding horrible once that was based on coronavirus. Maybe, maybe you should put it, put it out. More questions? Yeah. Hello, Clarence. Thank you for your talk. It was Thank very you. interesting. 
Um, I'd like to know how does how do you make the associations between colors and sounds? If it's just an instinctive thing, or, or if you have like a pattern or something like this. Thank you. I do have what people call synesthesia. Even as a child, different pitches had different colors for me. Different words even had different colors. One word might be green, one word might be pale blue. For instance, the color, the key of E flat was always a royal blue. The key of D major was always red for me. So that's something I've had since my childhood. But I don't want to make a principle out of it. I used it in that one piece in which I used colors to represent pitches. But that was again, not the piece itself. The piece was not made based on colors. I made the colored images based on the piece. So that's something that I can't help. It's just there, synesthesia. OK, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, so maybe we, we, uh, Jose, one more? The last one. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Clarence, it, I think it's no a, a fast one. And because th there's a hype now in academia about the, um, the preservation of digital, uh, digital uh, works, digital artwork, uh, you work a lot. Uh, you, you, you work a lot and you work uh, for, for a long, long time. With, with computers, with uh, operative systems, etc. Uh, I know that you that you write your own code. Uh, I'm I, I'm not sure, but I think you write your own code. I do. I do. Are, are, um, so because you have a lot of experience uh, on on this this crazy evolution, and it's so fast evolution of computer systems, etc. Et and I think for an artist, it's very hard to. Uh, to recover the work every time that appears a new a new software or a new system or a new computer, how how do you deal with that? It's a problem for you. Do um, uh, yeah, that's that's the question. Okay, when I started to use computers back in 1970, the computers were as big as a room, and they had 100 kilobytes of memory, and the feedback was about two hours in length. You gave your punch cards into a window and two hours later you could pick up the result printed on paper and then you had to study the results. Things have changed dramatically. For me, I made choices in my life. In 1970, I decided to learn the programming language Fortran. And when I finally in 1984 bought my own computer for a lot of money, it take, took me seven years to pay back that money. It had one megabyte of memory. It had a hard disk of 10 megabytes. And I have that computer now in storage. But when I did that, I found I could not continue to use Fortran because the Fortran compiler was too expensive. But I discovered there was a Pascal compiler, which was cheaper. And so I learned Pascal. In 2009, I wondered whether I should move to C. I did not want to move to C++ because that's too complicated. But I tried C for about three weeks. I programmed only in C. And one of the chapters in my book on music quantics, which is the links between mathematics and music, acoustics and music, phonetics and music, this book has chapters devoted to informatics and music. And first, I used Pascal as my language to uh, describe how to use software in, in programming. But then when I tried to use C, I decided not to use it, although I changed my chapters in the book to C, because C is more interesting to most people than Pascal. But I decided, given my age, I have no time left in life to learn new languages. So I'm still using Pascal, which I've been doing since 1984. And um, Audio Busk is based uh, on Pascal as well? Yes. Yes. So Audio Busk is one of your... Auto, Auto Busk. Auto Busk, yes, sorry. One of your major softwares that uh, were actually rebuilt by many uh, computer musicians and still influence a lot of compositions. Thank you so much for, for, for that. It's a reference for all of us. Thank you. Any more? Okay, so I think we... We can close now the session. 
Thank you so much, dear Clarence, and a big applause. My great pleasure. And I can send Jose the PowerPoint as a file so that you can have it in your library. Thank you so much, and I will just close the, the session because it's very fair to say, especially these days, that uh, apart from all the music that you wrote, you are an incredible humanist promoting humanism uh, between your students, and they all have the feeling that um, shaking Barlow's hand, it's more important than Sinatra's hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, thank you.